I'm just going to look up in the nice time sky. I'm sure many of you have seen something like this where you're looking up and all of a sudden you just see some bright point of light it appears to be moving against the stars in the background. And it doesn't blink. It doesn't have any noise. And realize then that you're looking at satellites. The 1957, since the first satellite was put up in orbit, more and more of these satellites have been put up into orbit around the Earth. And now we have even the International Space Station. And recently, more and more of these Starlink uh, satellites have been visible and putting on a spectacular show like a train. And so here, there's a space station and you'll see that it's a bright point of light moving at the stars in the background. And it's not a meteor, it's not a plane, and it's about 250 miles above the Earth, traveling at 17,500 miles per hour. And there's astronauts on board. And there it is right there. And I'm gonna show you how you can be able to find and watch satellites overhead. And did you know there are nearly 60,000 satellites in orbit? Some of these are rocket bodies and the majority of them are debris, meaning satellites are no longer functioning. This is a website called the Stuff in Space and here you can see the population of the satellites in 1957. 60,000 satellites have been put in orbit, and half of them are no longer functioning. And there's more to come in the next few years, especially with the Starlink that's happening. They're going to be adding 32,000 more. And so, majority of them are low-orbiting satellites. And they're generally two to 300 miles above the Earth. And then you can click on any one of those. You can get the identification of the satellites. But then you see these satellites are about 23,000 miles away. These are the geocentric satellites. And so check out the stuff in space so you can get the population of the satellites. Okay. So there are the low orbiting Earth observing satellites as you guess here. And majority of them are pointing down and they're traveling at 17,500 miles per hour. And so they can orbit the Earth in about 92 minutes. Some are going pole to pole, some are equatorial, depending on their mission. And once they're going pole to pole, they're uh, scanning the Earth, and some are doing a lot of different variety of emission. And then these guys uh, here, and these are called the geocentric uh, satellites, and they're about roughly 23,000 miles, uh, 23, miles away from the Earth. And they're in sync with the Earth's rotation. And they move much slower. And these guys are, have a mission to uh, observe the Earth weather. They can be the communication satellites. And so there's a whole variety of uh, missions that are now uh, around the Earth. And then you go to this website called Earth Observatory. And here you can see the data that's been collected by the satellites okay? and a whole variety of the very important data to help us understand the condition here on Earth. And so, for example, you see this map here. Look at the sea surface temperature okay? so over a period of time. So you can monitor the condition here on Earth uh, by a whole variety of different wavelengths. Okay? And so infrared, x-rays, gamma rays, and you name it. Okay? There's a whole variety of them. And their main purpose is to monitor the Earth, and that includes weather. They have a very important role. The largest and the brightest object is the International Space Station. It's been in space since 1998. They're always surprised to see how many people have never seen the space station fly over and over that period of time. So it's been up there for quite a while and there's been about 240 plus astronauts 
that have lived on the space station. The space station is about the size of a football field. It has these huge solar panels. And that far we can see it because it's so big and reflective. It's traveling at 17,500 miles per hour and go around the Earth in about 92 minutes. So that means it can go around the Earth about just, just a little more than 15 times a day. So the astronauts on board was the day and night change just about every 45 minutes. So this is a low orbiting uh, satellite and uh, so you'll be able to see the space station and uh, because it's, it's on an inclination of 56 degrees, almost pole to pole. Okay? So the main role of the space station is that it's a microgravity laboratory where they're doing experiments that can only be done in space. So they do a lot of science and, and do a lot of observing. So we had the crew of astronauts, sometimes four, three, up to six. They've had a dozen, so they can have astronauts live up there for a long period of time. And they see if there's science experiments in space, but also more importantly, they see how microgravity affects the human body. And so when, if we're ever going to go to the moon and on to Mars, we have to understand how microgravity affects the human body. And so this is a very important mission. And it's been up there for since 1998. So think about this. When you see the space station fly over, you're seeing that we have the crew that's living on the space station. And so uh, the space station is a wonderful laboratory that has a lot of contributions, a lot of spin-off for us here on Earth. And so uh, the space station will be continue to be up there for the next several years. And I'll show you how to be able to see the space station fly over over your head. And so maybe somebody watching this want to become an astronaut in the future. Look like a lot of fun. To locate the International Space Station, you can go to the website called Spot the Station. It's a wonderful website that you can get the studying opportunities specifically for the International Space Station worldwide. So for your location, go to this area here and go for Portland. Or you can enter the city of Portland. You click on that, and then it's the sighting opportunities. And then you go, it loads up the latest data for the sighting opportunities. And look at that. There's plenty of opportunities to see the International Space Station. Unfortunately, now for May, the space station is in the early morning. And so uh, there are times that it's in the early morning. Then you don't see it for a while because it's shifting eastward. And then you'll see it in the evening. So you can go through a series where you can see it only in the morning. And then you see it, don't see it at all. And then you'll see it in the evening. So it goes kind of uh, in that fashion that uh, certain times a month you'll see it in the evening and some in the morning. So... Let's say that we're going to go out and look at the International Space Station. Uh, so this is covered the month of uh, May. So let's go in. Let's say we're going to go out tonight. May. Um, what you have here are uh, the date, visib visibility, how uh, long it will be visible, maximum height, and appears and disappear. And so uh, let's go to... May 13th, it look like we have like three opportunities here. Uh, 18, 13, 10 degrees, um, not too shabby. Uh, the one you want to find is the one that's at maximum height. So you can go into May 14th even, at 39 degrees. Uh, here's uh, 46. So you can see there's a whole variety of different um altitude. So let's go into, let's say May 15th right there. Okay. 
So that's the one we're going to use to say that we're prepared that we have good opportunity to see the International Space Station uh, for six minutes at 75 degrees. That's actually pretty good. It moved from the uh, northwest and moved towards the southeast. And I'll show you how to prepare for that and once you have this data. This is another website that I want to share with you that uh, I recommend in finding your space station data. It's called heavensabove.com. And you want to make sure, first of all, that your location is set up for Portland or your general location. And then you can see there's a nice collection of different uh, sighting opportunities and astronomy and so on. So it's got a lot of good data. Uh, you can also use it as an app on your phone, which is I highly recommend. So right here is the International Space Station. Okay? And when we saw about the station, uh, generally these are the same uh, lists that you would get um, on heavenbob.com, just like you did on Spot the Station. And we were looking at May 15th, and there's that one that's 75 degrees right there. Okay, same time for 12. If you click on this, though, it gives you a really nice map. Okay? And this time, with this map, you can see the path when the space station is visible. Okay? So the arrow represents the direction. So it's moving from the northwest. It's nearly overhead and finishing out towards the um, east. Okay? So you want to use some references uh, in preparing for the sighting. Let's say there's the Big Dipper right there. Okay? And you can use Ursa Major as a guide. And then if it starts going overhead, you go by Vega, Cygnus the Swan, all of those. And there's Mars, there's Jupiter, and so on. You use these stars as a reference so when you're looking out for the space station, Use that as a guide. And then you can also print it out. And so you have it right there when you're ready to see the space station. The next step is to check the weather. I mean, you don't want to go get up in the morning and find out, oh gosh, it's, it's raining. So you can really should check the weather first. And I, I recommend clear outside. And this is one I like to use because it's designed for astronomers. So go to clear outside, enter the city location, and then you'll get your forecast. You look at this, you see all these colored bars. Right? You have the date, you were talking about the 15th. You give you the approximate phase of the moon. And generally, you can see the space station regardless what phase of the moon. It's very easy to see whether it's full or not. Right? Now, if you get a lot of red like this, okay, that means it's not good. Right? So you want to look for something like this when you have green. That means that you get the <laughs> good viewing opportunity versus uh, when it's yellow, kind of mediocre. Okay? And then when it's switched to either midday, okay, so that this line right here represents noon, and then you have uh, sunrise, sunset. Let's go back to the 15th. Then you expand on it. Okay, and these are the hours. And then move down a little bit. Okay, we have the amount of cloud. So if you have um, lots of clouds, you're going to see it's about 100%. It's not looking very good. What's cool though is that it shows you this past the International Space Station opportunities right there. So uh, we were just talking about that, uh, which one would be ideal to watch. This is the one that we were looking at. Okay, so it's going to be 75 degrees, but at that time, it looked like it's going to be pretty overcast. So maybe in your area, it could be clear. Okay, it looked like a good chance of rain, precipitation. Uh, not looking very promising at all. But I would encourage you to check your your weather for your area before you go out observing 
And you can see right there, there's even the International Space Station sighting times listed as part of the weather. Now we're going to go outside. And you can use these available apps of your choice. Uh, a lot of times these applications do have the satellite listed. And so pick a choice. So if you can use uh, Skywalk, so Google Sky. Uh, even uh, Solarium has its own little app. But pick and choose an application that, of your choice that will work for you. And here, yeah, outside, you want to give yourself about maybe 10 to 15 minutes before the, the satellite or the space station is due to appear. Okay, so go outside. The first step you need to do is you find your compass bearing. Okay, so you're facing north and find the Big Dipper. Okay, there's Ursa Major, the Big Dipper. Two end stars of the bowl pointing directly to. Polaris. Okay. Now Polaris from Portland is about 45 degrees. Okay. So use that as a guide to help you understand the altitude that we're going to see of the space station. So Polaris is about 45 degrees. So straight up overhead would be 90 degrees which is the zenith for the observer and then at the horizon is zero so essentially halfway up the sky. So 75 degrees is going to be higher than Polaris. It's almost in between being straight up overhead and to about this point here. And so that's a good way to measure the height. Or you use, make a fist with your hand, extend your right arm full out, and that fist may 10 degrees. Okay. And so you put that on the horizon and then make a fist with your left hand, put it on top of that. You have 20 degrees. So you can build on that. So it would take about eight, almost eight fists above the horizon to get 75 degrees. And so get your comfort direction. And for May 15th, as you see on the list, 4.12 a.m. is that's when it's going to be at its highest point. It's about 75 degrees for Portland. It's going to be moving from the northwest to the southeast. So here's north and here's west. So you want to find northwest. Okay. And then it's going to finish out toward the southeast. So it's going to cover quite a bit of the sky. So it'll move from the northwest to the southeast. If you go back to this map, on heavensabove.com and orient yourself to the direction. Okay? And uh, I'm going to go turn it around a little bit like this. So you basically want to face the sky that when it's going to appear, so it's going to appear in this direction, disappear over here, and then be nearly overhead. Now remember, it's going to go by the, one of the key star and we start with Vega right here. Okay, there's Vega. So we're going to use that as a reference. And there's the Big Dipper. It's going to go right along this path here. Okay, and so once you got all of those, and then we're ready for the flight, and I'm going to move forward. And this is the time that you can start looking for the space station. And for some people, this is the first time they would see the space station. There's always a show stealer uh, for the star parties. Okay? So you're facing out there. Now keep in mind, too, that on the about the station and heaven to bomb, sometimes you have to be patient. It can be a few minutes here and there, depending on your location. Okay? So give it a here and there a few minutes okay so keep your eye out toward the northwest and make noise when you start to see it that's the fun thing is you want to make noise and people get pretty excited they say wow there's a space station okay and so you face toward the northwest okay and it will appear to be arriving 
fairly slow. That's because you're at a steep angle, okay? So it's essentially coming towards you, okay? Then it will get brighter and brighter. Okay? And there at the space station, it's arriving now from the northwest. If you mind, it's traveling 17,500 miles per hour, to about 240 miles above the Earth. And the reason you see it is because it's the station itself is about the size of a football field. Okay? And so you're seeing a lot of reflection. And then it starts to appear, and you see that it's done coming up over the horizon. It's a kind of a slow process. And we're running on real time. Then it starts to pick up speed a little bit. And then even while you're watching, you might see other satellites in the same area. And that's because the sun is just below the horizon. Okay, and here this morning, so the sun's going to rise from the east. Okay, and this is when it's just at a point that you start seeing a whole bunch of satellites, maybe half a dozen or more. And because the sun is just right at the angle, you're in the dark, and then you have the satellite overhead, the low orbiting satellites. Okay. And then you see the space station. If you have a camera, a DSLR, you can put it at uh, 800 ISO and put it down to about 3.5 f-stop. And you do a long exposure. And this is a fun way you can see, actually see the station appear in your picture. But you take about maybe two minutes, three minutes, five minutes. You'll see Star Trail, but the space station is bright enough, it makes a nice image on the camera. And some now um, iPhone can make these pictures. So a lot of excitement right now. And here's the space station. It's been in orbit since 1998. And it's easy to find from your own backyard. Okay? So it's fairly bright now. And it's about a magnitude of minus two. And it's really easy to see. And it's fun to watch. As you see the space station, don't see uh, the blinking lights. It's moving at a pretty steady speed at 17,500 miles per hour. And you don't hear the engine because you're outside the atmosphere. Okay? Keep in mind that this is where we have astronauts who are working and living on the space station. But it's also interesting to, me, uh, to note that the crew is on Moscow time, not Houston. So being four o'clock in the morning, they're just kind of getting almost ready for dinner. See, there's another satellite right over there, right there, okay? And there's just that one is artificial satellite. So you can see right off the back that you will find some other satellites in view. Okay. And then you can see that it's getting higher. It's quite visible now. Even if there are partly cloudy skies, you can see it kind of poke through the clouds. And even if the moon is near full or full or no moon, the space station is still easy to spot, okay? So as you notice that when it gets overhead, that it goes pretty steady, okay? And remember the path that's now going by the handle of the Big Dipper, and then it's going to fly by Vega, and then finish off. And now in some cases, you'll see the space station Overhead, then all of a sudden it disappears. Not because it's going into the Earth's shadow, in which it looked like a kind of a, a magic trick. All of a sudden you see it, and then you don't. Okay, so this particular case, it goes on for about six minutes. And going from the west 
to the east. Now, you can see this almost on a daily basis, but it really depends on uh, the location. So, as I mentioned, uh, sometimes you see it in the morning, like it is now in May. Then you see it in the evening, and then you don't see it at all. Okay? So you, you just have to check the schedule and make sure that you're there to be able to see uh, the space station at a desired time. And sometimes people don't realize when they look up, they see this bright object. And you can go over there and tell them, oh, that's the space station, and explain why and how. Most applications are good are for identifying the time and the location, even how to map. Okay, so pick a choice, pick a application that works for you, and you go out and enjoy the space station. And on this particular morning, we can see a wonderful view of Jupiter, Saturn, Mars, and the Moon. And then there's Comet Swan over there and the northeast, and that is becoming a very bright comet. Okay. Um, so that one there requires a good map and a good uh, spotty scope or telescope to be able to see the comet. Okay. So hopefully this helps you be able to go out and absorb the space station. Uh, you can do it um, throughout the year. And it's going to be up in orbit for a while, so There'll be plenty of opportunity and you go out and share it with your friends and family and enjoy the view of the International Space Station. Now we're going to go back to heavens above and lately you've been hearing a lot about this Starlink, this uh, wonderful display of the train of satellites that observe in the night sky. And what Starlink is, is it, this is a uh, SpaceX project by Elon Musk that is launching about uh, 60 satellites per launch. And the goal is to reach 12,000 and eventually even up to 32,000 that will provide internet coverage. So you'll see in this diagram here that you see all of these mesh satellite orbiting over the Earth at roughly about 200 miles. They're low orbiting. So they're going to provide internet uh, contact so that in the future you'll be able to get Wi Fi just about from any remote location anywhere around the world. So that's the goal. Uh, there's some controversies with this as well that. Uh, with these vast number of satellites, as you'll see in this picture here, that it affects observatories uh, trying to take a long exposure, and then they have these satellites ruining the view. Okay? But the, apparently, that at this stage, uh, SpaceX and Starlink, uh, Starlink have been able to provide a shielding to cut down on the reflection. So that's the controversy right there. Okay. But let me show you how to identify these uh, Starlink passes. So you have actually two ways you can do it. Okay. This one here, you link on that. And when you get to the Starlink, you do the pull down menu. And then you see these are different batches that were launched uh, in orbit. Okay. So we just had one recently. Then right off the bat, you know that there's not any available for the next couple of nights. But if you go forward, you can see in advance if there's ever going to be any time that you can see it. So you can see it's not going to be for quite a while. That this particular group is not going to be visible uh, for Portland uh, at this time. Okay? But if you go back over here, you go down to April batch, nothing there. Go to March. Nothing there. Go to February. Now, look at that. Look at all of those lists. A very long list. Okay? And so you can go in and you can see plenty of opportunities to see the Starlink. And there will be um, common occurrence uh, for a while. 
um, which is uh, going to be pretty standard to be able to see um, these Starlink. Okay, if we go back up to January, see another list. And this list here, you see, and you see, it goes on and on. Okay, in November uh, launch, May, not as much. Okay, and then another way you can uh, look at this list. You go back to the home page, and on the home page, backing up, you got go back there. You can see that's quite a list. Okay, so. It's going to be a pretty common appearance to see these uh, Starlink. If you go back to this site, okay, you go to a 3D model. And there it shows you where these, what they call groups train, okay, where they're visible, okay. If we did before, go back up to the group, and uh, let's say January, okay. You can see where they are located. Okay, they're not um, in position yet. Uh, they're just getting started. Now using the ion propulsion, and eventually we'll push it up to about three to four hundred miles above the Earth. Okay, so if you see one that looks like it's going to be proximity to your location, like here, you'll be able to see the Starlink. Okay. Another site I want to show you is this one right here. It's James Darpin. Darpin. There's the link site right there. And you can see this uh, very well designed um, web page. Right? So you can see a train of 60 satellites. And here is the view above the Earth. There you are. Make sure you have your location. This is the map that so you can uh, essentially move it around, okay? And then let's say go to Sunday. Sunday looks good. These X means uh, how many satellites you'll be able to see. So on Sunday at 9.29 p.m., there's the view. Then you start seeing a train of these satellites. You can see it's fairly low, even though uh, the opportunity is there, but it's fairly low. Or you can see Saturday. That it looks a little higher, but you can see one after another. Now the key thing is, they're only about a magnitude of four, generally. Uh, barely getting up there to two sometime or three, but they're faint. They're about the same brightness of the Big Dipper and the Little Dipper. Okay, So they do uh, make it a little bit challenging to see. Okay, because they're not obviously bright like the space station, but it is possible to see it. And it's ideally, you want to see it without the full moon. Okay, so you, you find a good clear sky, and you're blocking out as much light as you can around your house. You look up, and you'll see a whole variety of this. And many of the applications have this that you can be able to go out and look at the Starlink. 